Hey there, and welcome to the podcast Tiling Connect, hosted by Mark Moskwa. This show is designed to connect people with the best information intended to strengthen the business of tiling. To keep up to date with all the episodes, don't forget to subscribe. Hey everybody, Mark here from Tiling Connect. Welcome back to the show. We are very fortunate to have another amazing guest join us today. Aaron Huey from Coach to the Tradies is joining us and uh, pretty lucky to have him here. Um, Aaron, welcome to the program. Cheers for having me on, Mark. I appreciate the invite. Thanks, mate. Now, uh, I, I know this is going to go particularly well today because uh, you're, a, you're a seasoned uh, podcaster, which is great. So I'm sure that um, there'll be no nerves between either of us and we can have a, uh, a really excellent uh, flowing chat. Um, but, mate, you've been doing a lot of work in the mental um, health awareness space um, for, you know, the tradie community and obviously Tiling Connect. We've got a, a rather lo- – well, we're building a rather large community. I think we're getting there. You know, we're – you know a few thousand deep um, across our social channels and 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 building every day and uh, mate tell I suppose I don't want to steal your thunder but can you tell us a little bit about your story in construction and yep. why you are doing what you're doing in that in that space that we just mentioned yeah absolutely um so as you can hear from the accent I'm not originally from uh, this side of the world so I grew up over uh, in the UK. Uh, I've been in the carpentry industry since I was 16, left school to become a carpenter. Um, moved to Australia in 20, 2010, chased the dream of the sun, sea, the sand and all of that. Um, came here wanting to not get into construction, but when you've done something for so long and it's kind of the only thing that you know, uh, I fell into it. So, you know, being a carpenter here, moving up into, you know, site foreman, site manager, and then uh, having a family here and being in construction, it's, you know, the, the long days, the long hours, it's, it's something that I never really wanted to have. You know, I grew up with my old boy being in the British Army. He was always away, you know, whether he was away on tour or away, you know, what was the war or practicing or whatever it was. I was kind of conscious I didn't want to become that dad that was never there. And unfortunately, being in the construction industry, especially being at the level that I was as a site manager, you know, you're the first, you're the first to open the gate and the last to leave and the phone never stops. So, um, for all intents and purposes at the time, you know, I was here with my now ex-wife and we had uh, one daughter, she was two, uh, everything was going great, you know, was kind of in the country of my dreams, at the time I was really enjoying what I was doing, you know, marriage, relationship wise, everything was going great, and then I had a friend pass away back home in Scotland, a really, really close friend of mine, oh, sorry um, had uh, an, an unfortunate town events with the police and he came off the wrong side of it. So, you know, the grief of uh, of losing losing a friend, you know, I've never really lost to, you know, grand, grand, you know, people like that. But a best friend, someone who's really close to me, it kind of really rocked me. But it almost took a a whole year before we were able to get back to Scotland to, um, you know, see his graveside. And it wasn't until I was there that it, it really hit me that, you know, he's gone, he's no longer here. Being on this side of the world, you know, it's not uncommon not to speak to people for three, four, five, six months back home. So for a little while, it just felt like we hadn't spoke. But the realization of standing over his grave that he was no longer here, I then came back to Australia. My mental health just dipped massively. Like my, uh, uh, I think it was just obviously the grief of losing a friend, but it was the anger and the way that it happened and the things that were said about him. And um, I'd never really dealt with depression or anxiety or anything like that. It came on pretty quick. You know, I was being really angry at sight. I was really snappy when I got at home. I wasn't able to think straight. I, I now call it the grey because it's like when you're you can't think properly. You're not registering things. You're just doing things on autopilot. And I um you know I did what most men do. I waited as long as possible for going to see anybody. And my you know my ex wife mm-hmm. she said to me like you're not right. You need to go and speak to somebody. So I eventually I did. I went and saw the doctor. Got put on a mental health plan and then got you know some medication to help with the mood swings. And I got uh, sent to a psychologist to you know do some sessions with them and I did about probably the I don't think I did the full 10 with them but between the medication and talking to him it was clear it was just grief you know it was like everything was all right so I managed to get myself back on a kind of level playing field where I was able to you know self-regulate my anger things were good at home by this time we had uh, a second daughter so she was only she was only a couple of months old when I had the same thing happen here a friend another friend pass away overnight just like that um 
both of these guys are the same age as me. Both of these guys had two young kids and they just disappeared. Uh, and, and it mm-hmm. not only did that affect me again and probably it triggered more the second time round. I had to go back on medication. I was more, by this time I was a site manager, so I was running sites and trying to hold it all together. I just, you know, I wasn't doing it great. Um, but what I did find this time round was by this point I was looking to better myself I was questioning you know why am I doing what am I doing you know what's life all about the the, the main things that you question when you lose someone but having lost two people in such a course period of time it really made me sit back and reflect on you know the hours that I was doing the the time away from family was I being the best that I could be so I uh, I started looking at um, personal development so you know Tony Robbins coaching sessions just just anything Mm -hmm. to kind of you know not only just help me but kind of Help me understand different things, um, and I found a uh, coach, a personal development company here in Sydney. I went to one of their weekends. It was like a personal intensive weekend, and it it was a very eye opening experience. I've never really been in a room of any of that kind of jumping around and you know live your best life stuff. But when I saw what the guy was able to do um, on stage with three or four different people you know, talked about where they are in life, where they want to be and help them kind of reframe what they were looking at. I was like, oh, I want to do that. Like that's, I, I can see myself doing that. So I ended up becoming part of their, I joined their coaching company Um I was coached by them for probably a year. And then they asked me to become one of their coaches. Um, and this was pre-COVID 2019. So I thought, right, this could be, it could be something here as a, as a job. It could be something as a, maybe even a side hustle just to get out of construction because I was looking to move out, do something different. Um, so for the whole year of 2020, I was coaching their clients, so individuals, men, women of all ages and facets. And I was learning things by coaching them, but also by my own coaches about you know mindset and um, goals and outlooks and just things that no one, and especially in the construction space, but more so in my whole life, no one had ever really spoke to any of this. You know, you're, you're able to, mm. just because you came from somewhere doesn't mean that's where you're going to end up. You know, you're able to do yeah, right. what's going on for you. You know, the, the the reasons that we do the things that we do and where they come from, like a lot of people don't understand that, you know, the the habits that you have can come from your, your mum and dad or the area that you grew up in. And they may not be the habits that you want or resonate with now. And until people realize that, you know, especially when it comes to construction, like there's a lot of guys who um, will work all day, go home if they go home um, or go to the pub and, you know, they'll drink drugs, gamble, um, you know, loose women, men, whatever it may be. And I was finding that all of that is filling a void in something, but nobody tells you that. Nobody tells you Mm. that there's there's an underlying factor. So it was at the end of 2020, 2021, one of my coaches said to me, she goes, you know, and I had told her this. I said, you know, I'm learning stuff here that no one has ever taught me as a tradesman um, on the construction site or at home as an apprentice. And she goes, well, maybe you should. Maybe you should share what you've got with other people who are maybe feeling the same as you and, you know, men who are wanting to do better, wanting to strive, but don't really know that that's a possibility. You know, the, the toughen up, she'll be right kind of mentality that we have in construction probably stops a lot of guys from doing that. So I was mm. like, you know what, that's, that's exactly what I'm going to do. That's, so start of 2021, during COVID, I picked up the phone and I called Master Builders here in Sydney. And I said to them, I said, look, you know, I'm just wondering what's out there for our men when it comes to our mental health, the wellness, the personal development space in construction. Uh, and they said, uh, you know, the only thing that we've really got right now is we have mates in construction who do the suicide prevention and awareness talks and the odd, are you okay day? And I was like, that's a fucking huge gap. Like it's literally yeah. <clears throat> talk about suicide. Here's how not to kill yourself or hope you're all right out of the 130, 365 days of the year for one day. I was like, that's, yeah. just not good. that's not good enough. I was like, I, I don't know what I, I don't know what I can do. I said, but I'm going to change this. So that's, you know, that set me on a, a journey over the past, probably to be coming up for three years now off, not only keep educating myself, but having conversations with guys and, you know, going to every, anything possible that I can to share the awareness of what I'm doing. And what I find is the conversations that I have with people that is amazing. Like the, the people who you would think would never open up and talk about their own mental health or what they've been through or what helped them uh, is, you know, I'm talking like skip drivers who are tattooed from the head to the feet with the gold change. You know, you're, you're stereotypical, stay away from him. He's nuts. 
have a chat with those guys and they're like, oh yeah, you know, I had I tried to kill myself a few years ago or I lost my wife or, you know, whatever it may be. And they're like, but then, you know, I decided to change and this is what I did, you know. And it's whether it's a coach or a mentor or even just, you know, finding a group of people that help them along the way. And I was like, okay, well, I'm, this is then now what I want to build. So I'm, I'm in the process of building a modern trading community, uh, you know, a community of men who want better, want to learn, but the stigma of being in an industry that's maybe stopping them from looking for the help or saying that they're doing, you know, I mean, unfortunately, the, you have it here in Australia, the tall poppy syndrome. You know, if someone wants mm. to better themselves, the crowd bring them down. And I don't know whether I'm uh, blessed in that sense as I've got to the stage where I don't give a fuck what anyone else thinks. Like, I do the best <laughs> for me, for my girls, for those around me. Um, yeah. And I will... Um, power and implore anyone else who wants to do the same and bring them along for the journey. So mm. yeah, that's, that's kind of where, where I am now, um, building both the community, but as well as working one-on-one with guys and then taking this out to construction sites. Like we have a great movement. Uh, well, I say great. There's a better movement with the conversation in construction, but I, I definitely think we're a, a long way away from where we need to be. Yeah, mate. Look, um, um, what an intro. Holy shit. Um, a lot there I don't to unpack. Know I was going to talk and talk. That's okay, buddy. A lot to unpack, and um, my mind was just ticking over because, obviously, you know, being um, you know what I've done in the life that I've led, um, I've faced you know some significant traumas in my past that have, you know, um, I've suffered from the same, um, um, oh, you know, it's, it's a sickness, so to speak, but it's I've suffered from the same problem, you know, uh, of of depression and, um, you know, not not really understanding what it was or how it was impacting my life and and uh and and even today you know i i um I, I still reflect back upon the first time I had to deal with death um with someone and it was back in nineteen ninety five so this was a long time ago, but I was twenty one twenty i think at the time, oh, and really? I had lost my my boss at the time and he was like I had worked with this guy for probably about six or seven years growing up as a teenager and I had um, climbed the corporate ladder within this business and he was sort of like a mentor at, but in the past, sort of in the last six months of his being on the planet, he was like a real close mentor because I was um, um, promoted in the job and I had a company car and I had 15 stores to look after and and this guy's name was Mark as well and he was just, he was sort of like a big brother and he took me under his wings and uh, then unfortunately he he succumbed to a tragic car accident and uh, it was fatally killed. Like it was taken away in a heartbeat and I remember getting the call and, and, and I, I reflect upon that story often in my life because... It was when I now that I'm much older, I've learned from my experiences of 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 recent trauma in the last sort of ten or fifteen years how to identify it and and know what the triggers are and understand that when I'm slipping into that vortex of of shit, um, and yeah, it's 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 not nice and 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 it doesn't matter who you talk to. Usually, in most instances, it comes out of well, not always, but in a lot of instances with people that I know, it comes out of uh, you know a significant trauma that's occurred in their lives, and and people generally don't know how to deal about deal with it, and they generally tend to bottle it up, and and or in this case, in in man's land, we um, we, as you poetically put it before, we're told to toughen up and not talk about it. Um, you know, should be right, should be right, mate. Just move on and get the job done. And if you try and have a conversation around it, you you you're frowned upon. You looked at as weak, um, and it's just it's just one of those things that you know it's it's really difficult to comprehend. So, um, mate, tell me like when you when that occurred in in your life, uh, what sort of how 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 was your community impacted? Like your friends, your family, um, you know, when that happened that first in that first instance, is it was it. Was everyone was sort of on the same trajectory or was it different? Yeah, it was. So uh, I, my friend who passed away, he, I have it tattooed on me. He was a, a true gentleman. Like everybody who, uh, and I've changed a lot of the things I do to keep his memory alive. So he's a type of guy who, you know, we'd be 
at house parties as you are when you're like, you know, 19, 20, 21, till three, four o'clock in the morning. And he wouldn't leave the party without going around and saying goodbye to everybody. Like he, everybody knew him. He was the life and soul of the party. Like he would pass people in the street, their mothers, their grandmothers. Um, and he wouldn't say, he wouldn't pass them without saying, hello, how are you? You know, he was just that type of guy. He was just there for everyone and everyone. So <clears throat> the story that came out about him and the way that he was attacked, people just knew straight away something was up. So he was he was attacked by nine police officers. He he was originally from wow. Sierra Leone, so he's of African um, descent. So uh, it's it like seven o'clock on a Sunday morning. He was he had been at a house party. He came out and he was on his way to somewhere. And for whatever reason, there had been a fight. The police were called and they nine officers turned up, tased him, put him on the floor, maced him, cuffed him, and he was gone within forty seconds. Like he was out. And then wow. they tried to blame, like they tried to say it was like a six foot um, four black man uh, attacked uh, a young female officer who attended her own with a knife. He never used knives. He didn't need to. He was only five eight. He was the same height as me. Like he's big stature of a guy. He went to the gym. He was healthy. He looked after himself. But instantaneously, like just the light that they were trying to shine on him, everyone was just like, no, that's not Sheik. Like it's not that no, something no. up here. Um, and yeah, so the whole community rallied round about him. Like he's actually got to the stage now where his family are they've taken it to the human rights court in Europe to try and get because police Scotland have pretty much washed their hands with it they've no one will ever be blamed no one will ever be held accountable uh, you know there's been documentaries about it on like BBC back home in the UK and you know they just tarnished his name but everybody knows that this just you know there was whether it was racism whether it was just wrong place wrong time whatever it was they tried to change the story so much within the first 24 hours they clearly knew that they had fucked up so that, because of that, like the whole community was affected. Like, look, you know, he, was a, he, he was a father to, he just had a 15 week old son, plus he had a three year old boy. Um, so they've lost dad. Like, you know, they're never going to have the dad. His sisters, who both moved up from London to live in Scotland to get away from all the violence in London, they didn't feel safe in Scotland anymore, so they've either moved back to London. I actually think one of his sisters moved back to Sierra Leone. So huge, huge void left in the community. Um, mm. And just for nothing, like just out of the blue, like it was really – like it, I remember the morning getting the message. So I woke up on a Monday morning. So the, the Sunday – the, the Sunday before, it was my daughter's second birthday. That Sunday morning, we had found out, me and my ex-wife had found out that we were pregnant with our next daughter. So, like, it was huge celebration. It was amazing. And then the next day, the Monday morning, I woke up to, like, missed calls on my phone from people back home. And I was like, oh, geez, somebody they must be celebrating back home or something. I'll get to that. But doing what most of us do, you know, I went to the toilet, sat down and opened up Facebook. And looked, and there was a, a post from his brother-in-law saying, "Does anyone have any information that led to the death? Does anyone have any information that led with the altercation that Sheku had with the police that led to his death?" And I had to read it like four or five times. And I was like, "You know, when you you know you're reading something, but you just yeah, ah, I, I must have read that wrong." And then I just burst into tears, like I, on the toilet. And my wife heard, and she came through, and she's like, "What's up?" And I couldn't even talk; like I just had to show her the phone. And we're just standing looking at each other, like outside the bathroom, and just like I just. No, nah. so I phoned my sister back home and my mum, and you know, same thing. Couldn't talk. Like he was just that close to. He was like another brother to to my family. Um, mm. So, and then yeah, just because of the year of not being able to get back home to him, it was all the stories in the press, all the write ups in the press, seeing all of the marches and everything that people did back home. But the one thing that stood out was everybody knew that it was bullshit. Like everyone had knew yeah. who he was and the type of guy that he was. So in that respect, it was it, it was great because he has, although they tarnished his reputation, everybody knows who and what he was. Um, and I'm going to get a little bit woo woo for you now, but it, it's pretty it's it's part of my story and why I've I kind of went down the path that I went. But a, a year after his passing uh well probably a little couple of months after coming home a friend of mine said that there's a lady up in Barrower waters here in sydney who she's a medium and she connects to people who have passed on if it's something that you you know you want to and i'm a kind of guy I'll, i don't disbelieve anything unless i've tried it myself and i was like you know what I'll yeah. see. You know, yeah. if it turns out to be this lady and she's full of it then at least i've had the experience um but i sat with this woman for about an hour and spoke to my best friend like the stories that came through were just, there's, there's certain things that only me and him knew about, like nobody else 
things that we did back home in the past, things that he was joking about. And, I, and just for an hour, like, I, and he even spoke about, like, his passing and what they did to him and, you know, where I was over here and just things that there's no way this lady, she's like a 60, 70-year-old lady. And it, it rocked me. I was like, well, if I am I'm speaking to somebody on the other side, then that means that this life is, there's more to life than what we think, what we've been told. Mm. And, and and she said to me when we finished, she said, you know, the, I can see that you're close. She, she said your brother, like she kept saying your brother's here. So that's how close we were. Um, and she said, you know, I can see that you're really close to your brother. Um, one thing, a piece of advice I'll give you, the best way to keep someone's memory alive or remember them is to be and act like they would. So that's, mm. that's the bit that I took away from her. Like, okay, I'm going to start being, you know, that just saying hello to everyone, you know, in a room of people, whether it's a networking thing or a social thing or a work thing, always saying goodbye, you know, not, not leaving without just those little interactions that he did. Um, and so that being said, it made me deal with his passing a lot easier. Like it made mm. me think that, yeah. you know, he's not just gone. He's actually, you know, whether he's gone on to another, another life, whether his soul's gone on to another place, it, it made me delve into the kind of spiritual side of things. So I got a, a spiritual mentor who I still speak to today and he taught me about, you know, the, the soul's journey. And, you know, some people think it's crazy and some people think it's woo woo. And, but what he has taught me has helped me deal with death and passing of others that, you know, this isn't final. There's more to life than just this. And I think that's another, that belief in the learnings and teachings that he's taught me is another reason that makes me want to push men to be better because it's like, you know, you, you only have this, one life that you're here for this time round. Mm. Don't waste mm. it. Whether you're here no, for another 50 no. years, whether you're here for two days, don't waste it. And why would you want to waste it by constantly falling back into the same patterns or blaming the people beyond, but like take ownership of what you, what your life it means to you. So that, yeah. Yeah. that's kind of been the catalyst that just keeps me pushing, keeps me going because I know that you only really have one chance of this life in this, this lifetime you know whether you get reborn and it starts again i don't know we'll find out once the lights go out eventually but <laughs> <laughs> it's um it's interesting interesting and in, like it's probably the only word that i can think of at the moment but i it comes up often on my social media feed because i do a lot of posting for the business that I run on the side and also for my for the podcast as well and, and just just in general. Um, it, it's just a way of connecting with people. And I think Jay Shetty um, interviewed Orlando Bloom in, and it keeps coming up on a snippet where they're talking about, you know, um, the power of, of just connecting with people. And, you know, I think Jay asks a question about, um, uh, asks Orlando a question and, and Orlando's response is basically, you know, make it great. Like when you, 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 when you're with someone, um, every moment that you're with them, make it amazing because you just don't know when you're going to get a chance to do it again because it, you know, yeah, you could leave and that could be very much the last opportunity that you get to see or speak to someone and um, yeah. spend time with them. So don't get caught up. I, I think the messaging behind it is that obviously don't get caught up in, in yourself and, and your ego and everything else, but, you know, make every moment in life count and certainly don't knock it until you try it because, um, until you try it, you've got no idea on you know what it's actually like. And um, yeah. being being a judge in life is not the place you want to be sitting, uh, or it's definitely not the seat you want to be sitting sitting in um, <laughs> and living a, a full and prosperous um, life. Yeah, yeah, I have. I've had so many people I've told that story to, and you know, especially the older generation, they just kind of fuss at it. And I'm like, well, try it. Yeah. Come with me. Come and sit speak to and see who, who comes through to you and they're scared. No, no. And again, like you said, there is the, the ego, the ego, if more men, especially like we don't know how to lose our ego or let it go for the sake of an argument. Like it's just, what's it worth? Like, you know, I, I remember go, growing up, my mom telling me never go to bed angry. Like always, if you have an argument, you know, sorry before you go to bed. Cause you never know if you'll wake up in the morning. And, you know, I, I grew up with my mum and dad both always saying, like, I love you or goodbye after every interaction, even whether it's like going to work or going out to the shops, like, because you just never know. And it never really resonated with me until the passing of my two friends, but more so since I've become the dad of three girls. Mm. Um, like, I'm, I'm grateful for every moment that I have with them. And, and I think that's doing the work that I do. It's, it's, it's looking for the, the, thing, the good things to be grateful for. Like negative people always look for the negativity and then they wonder why their life doesn't get any better. 
Yeah. Well, if you're only looking for the bad, you're going to get the bad. Whereas, you know, if you see the um, the greatness in everything, you know, whether it's a small thing or a large thing, like it's you you attract what you look for. Um, and yeah, it's you just don't know. Like mm. my dude, yeah, is, and, and this is uh, it's another thing I talk when I speak on site about. You know, people who are, are, are suicidal, or you know, I don't. I've never been in the mind frame of someone suicidal. I've spoke to a lot of people who have and have come through it. And obviously, you know, unfortunately in the construction industry, it's quite prevalent. It's quite a big thing for whatever reason. You know, I've asked the powers that be, you know, people who are smarter than me, people who be to uni that have studied this. And I'm like, why do our guys go to that? Like, why is suicide the easiest option? And they can't tell me. Like, they don't know. There's no significant factor other than they just feel mm. like they're a burden on people. So I kind of... I tell when I do my talks, I say to them, like, you know, if you are in this headspace and you do think that you'd be, you know, the world would be better off without you and your family would do much easier without you. I have two friends who would give anything to have another day. It was it was taken away from, they were in the prime of their life. They had two kids um, and they would give anything to have another day on on this earth. And, you know, some people say, oh, you can't say that. It's, it's selfish because you don't know what other people are going through. I'm not saying it to them to be nice. I'm saying it to give them a fucking shake up so that they don't take their own life because yeah. they, the void that's left by people when you're not here, like, you know, whether it's your family, your friends, your work colleagues, your community, the ripple effect is huge. Mm. And if people would just be more open to open up and asking for help or saying, I need help or I'm not doing great, instead of just bottling it all up and just, I'm a burden on these people, I don't ask for help. You know, I, people would prefer to have a phone call from you saying you know what i'm not doing great rather than open up the phone and see a facebook post or get a message from somebody saying oh did you hear about such and such is no longer here mm -hmm. it's as if we can get that message across to to guys you know everyone in general but for us in this space for guys in construction it's like dude don't just you're worth more um to everyone around you than you probably think and that happens yeah. from opening up in conversations and, mate, you've, and you raise, I mean, you've ra you're raising some really excellent points and, and I understand we're, and we'll deep dive into your systems and processes shortly around, you know, your methodologies and, and assisting and helping the community in construction. What is what? What does someone do if they're faced with this conversation on a job site or in, you know, in a lunchroom? Uh, or in construction. So how, like, I, I imagine it would probably be a, somewhat of a common question that they'd be like, well, you know, someone's just come and open, opened up to me about the problems that they're having. What do I do? Like, what's, what, 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 how do I, how do I respond? You know, because yeah. I think that would be someone's greatest fear is they go, oh shit, someone's going to open up to me and tell me that they've got issues. I, I, I'm not qualified. Like, how do, yeah. how do, how do, how do I, how do I handle what they're, going through like what do I do even even though that we're friends so have you seen that before and 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 what are some steps that people can and can do to help yeah absolutely and that that the fear of getting the answer that you don't want to hear is what stops most people asking that question um and you know it's not up to you to fix that you just point them in the right direction so mm. there's you know when the the, the mates in construction I mentioned they do a great suicide prevention awareness training and, and they let you know you know you just if you sent something, be a little bit pushy because some, they're not going to tell you that, like, what's going on for them. Um, to the point where, you know, you don't sit them down and say, I know that you're suicidal. But asking that question sometimes is enough to shock them. And you'd be amazed yeah. at the amount of people, and you'd be amazed at the amount of people who actually can't verbalize that. Are you suicidal? Are you thinking of harming yourself? Like the, you know, when I've done the, the suicide prevention courses, they actually get you to do it. And the amount of people who will either break down in tears and uh, they're not able to verbalize it. So it's it's something to practice being able to say it so that if you do come, ever do come across that, you're able to, one, verbalize it, pick up mm. on the symptoms of, you know, what's going on for them, whether their mood changed, you know, are they, are they distancing themselves from, you know, the crew on site? Are they coming in late? Yeah. Are they lethargic? Are they not doing their job? Are they just lost interest? You know, some of the key phrases are, you know, I just don't care anymore or, you know, what's the point? You know, these just these phrases. Um, but there's, you know, you can point them to all of the, you've got, you know, Lifeline, Beyond Blue. For us in construction, we've got TX and Trademark. Like they're a counselling service. I would put anyone to them. Like 
yeah, I'm wearing their gear. They come, their gear comes with a um, a QR code. You just scan that, and it takes you straight through to either the tech service or the phone service. Mm. Um, and their counselors, they're, they're just non-judgmental, and they can be anything from a full ten sessions to just a conversation with somebody, just helping them reframe it. So for us in construction, I would point them to T Action Trademark straight away. Um, because they're there and it's an instantaneous service and it's free. They don't have to worry yeah. about paying for it. Um, you don't have to, you know, it's, it's um, nobody knows about it either. It's between you and the council, whoever you get on the other end. Uh, and sometimes that's all it takes, just that one conversation. But also sometimes it's just asking them and then they go, no, what makes you think that? And it's enough mm. to shake them out of it because they're like, oh, you know, somebody's picked up on this. And it's, it's it, it, it is a daunting conversation to have with someone. However, if you, if you, do it and you come across from the place of love and concern and, you know, not want to lose a brother or a friend on site and put that across to them that, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing this to judge you, but I've just noticed a few things, you know, this is what, and, and put it across to them. You know, this is what I have noticed about you. I just wondered if there's anything all right, you know, um, and if you can do it away from people. So, you know, take them for a coffee or, you know, even if you, want to say, like, you know, fancy catching up for a beer tonight after work or whatever, and just approach it from a place of concern, not a place of kind of authority. Like, I know you're not well, you need to get that. Mm. And, and that's, yeah, there's no, there's no easy way to have the conversation, but no, I, I'd, no. I'd rather people had the uncomfortable conversations than be standing over somebody's casket. And if people, yeah. if, 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 you know, if we can get that through to people and get that across people's own kind of embarrassment and shame about talking about it or even owning up to it. Like that's, that's another thing. Like some people, uh, they don't really know what they're going through. Like they don't know, they might not know the symptoms themselves. Like I said, when I was going through it, I was just doing the, the daily steps of you know, getting up, going to work, doing the work thing, coming home, being a parent. And you just, you fall into the rut of just doing what you need to do. But then the, the gray kicks in and you don't, you just can't think straight. You know, if people can pick mm. up that you're not, you and they say this to you like sit down and have the conversation with them and then reflect on it don't and it's easier to say when you're not in that headspace but if you are try not to take offense to it they're just doing it from a place of of love and yeah you know concern for you yeah absolutely mate it's um yeah, it's it's never an easy. It's not an easy conversation to have. But if uh, look, if you yeah, a place of love is definitely the best place to um, come from in 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 regards to having a conversation with helping your mates. Um, you know, go through a tough time and yeah. So, mate, look, I know that you obviously are sharing some of your obviously personal and intimate um, experiences from what you've been through with the death of your mate. And obviously it's impacted, um, you know, your mindset and, and, you know, how how have you used um, the experience that you've been through to build processes around how to have – you know, build this business and, and and provide support to the construction industry. Talk us through that a little bit more about what you've learned and, and what are the some of the techniques that you have that you share with others to, to help them through? Yeah, let's uh, say that the first thing I have to learn is building a business. I never, ever wanted to be in business myself. Like I never, ever, I was happy to just be a chippy or a site manager working for somebody. So that's probably one of the biggest learnings for me is trying to grow and I'm still trying to grow like there's still you know I my business hasn't taken off to where I want it to be because uh, unfortunately it's an uncomfortable conversation and some people aren't really ready for it whether it be a construction business or a carpentry business electrical business so it's still I'm still working my way through establishing it um but from the coaching side of things and the mental health coaching side of things the the, the you know I just I haven't reinvented the wheel with this. Like coaching is different to counseling. So counseling takes past traumas and takes, you know, what you've been through and then helps you work through that. What my coaching is, I'll, I'll, I'll when I do an initial call with somebody, I find out where they're at, you know, ask them some questions about where they're at in life. And, you know, I've got a thing called the, the wheel of life. It asks you about your relationships, your fitness, your mental health, your spiritual, your financial, your business, pretty much all the myriad of where you are in life, where you'd like to be and say, 12 months, two years, five years. And then I work with the guys in between. Um, and it's, 
I've kind of come up with a four-step process, and I think you can use this for anything, whether it's you want to improve your business, whether you want to improve your relationship, your health. Uh, the first one is awareness. You, you need mm-hmm. to become aware of something isn't working for you, what you're doing wrong, you know, the situation that you're in. It can be everything from a, a work situation to a you know, toxic relationship to you're drinking too much, you're spending too much money. You know, you need to become aware of what it is that you want to improve on or take out. Um, and then secondly, you have to take ownership. Like you, I'm, I'm a huge advocate for saying, okay, enough is enough. And for most men, we have to go through something traumatic before we do that, which it comes with its pros and cons. I wish it wouldn't take us to go through, whether it's a, a breakup or a death or a loss of a business or, you know, alcohol, something before we go, right, okay, enough is enough. But however, sometimes you need that push just to, to get it done. So taking mm-hmm. ownership and saying, right, okay, fuck this. I'm, I'm not happy where I am, but whatever, whatever it is that you're at. I deserve better. I want better. Um, and then thirdly is getting education. So finding out, you know, how do I move from point A to point B? Who do I need to get in my circle? Like whether it's a coach, a mentor, you know, a community or whatever it may be. We, you know, when people say to me, I don't have time, you know, or mental health to ex- um, personal development is too expensive. You have YouTube, you have Audible, you have podcasts like this. There's so much stuff out there right now that's for free. So there's literally no excuse where anyone can tell me that we that they can't improve themselves because we have these phones on us 24 seven and they have the biggest library to everything. You know, you can yeah. be watching a video um, while you're on your lunch break, or you can be listening to a podcast on the drive to work. I took the radio out my truck four years ago because I was sick of listening to the shit on the radio. So now I constantly have these headphones in. So whether it's a podcast like this or yeah. an audio book yeah. or um, an audible something, I'm, constantly feeding myself knowledge about whatever subject it is that I'm at right and, now. And I say that to people all the time, um, and just picking up on what you said, shift your mindset away from entertainment to education. And if you can do that, um, step by step, day by day, you, it's, it's not going to happen overnight, but certainly the more you can educate yourself, the stronger you'll become as a person. Um, you oh, just have to turn. You have to turn off the. Edu- you have to turn off the entertainment. Uh, and I mean, not permanently. Like I'm not talking about everything. But if you're sitting there scrolling on your bloody phone for half an hour, forty five minutes, think of the half an hour, forty five minutes you've actually could have been listening to a podcast or watching a YouTube clip about yep. you know how to tie knots or I don't know if you're into sailing or whatever. But yeah, well, well that's it. There's everything out there. Like there's no that you can literally. You know, there's people who have built businesses just by watching somebody else do it on YouTube. Like the, yeah. there's nothing that you can't learn from some. It may, it may be the most important thing. It could be the most menial thing ever, but you can find it out there. And it's, we've been conditioned to come home, sit in front of the TV and watch all the crap on the TV. And they're called programs for a reason. And it sounds like a really guru thing to say, but they're programming you just to be stupid and just sit yeah. there on your yeah. arse for four hours a night so that you can go to bed, get up and go to, you know, your job. there's a, a terminology or there's a phraseology, I can't remember who said it, but it pretty much goes, you know, you you live in your box house, you sit at your box table eating your box meal in front of the box TV, and then in the morning you get up and you get in your box car to drive to your box office to sit in your box cubicle to move little boxes around to make more boxes for your boss. It's a very simplistic way to look at it. However, that's unfortunately what a lot of people do. Yeah. And yeah. until it, the penny drops, and you're like, okay, well, there's more to life than just, like you say, entertainment. Like, there's more to life. Like, you listen to the news, 99% of it is bad, and then at the very end, oh, and the cat was saved from a tree. So why would you want to listen to that on repeat three or four times a day if that? Uh, like, I, I, I'm, I'm not a massive, well, I should be, I, I, I rephrase this. Myself, I, I struggle to get physically fit and go to the gym because it doesn't interest me. I know it should. I'm getting older now. In the space I am, I'm, I'm, I'm more about the mind, but I know that I should be doing more with my body. So I use the analogy that when you want to get fit, you watch what you eat, watch what you put into your body, you train, you know, you, it's the same with your mind. You need to watch what you're putting in for your, into your brain, into your, your ears for your own mental health and for your own personal development. If you feed yourself the crap, then the outcome of it is you're going to be sad, negative, you know, you're not going to learn anything, you're not going to gain anything. And even working your brain, like, Reading, mm. 
like doing, you know, you can do some of those mind puzzles. You can do something, putting your mind at work constantly rather than just, a lot of people are just floating around on autopilot. You know, mm. how many times have you got to work and you're like, fuck, how do I get here? You've just driven yeah. like half an hour on autopilot or you come home from work and the next thing it's nine o'clock at night, you've had dinner, kids have gone to bed and you sit down and you're like, Jesus, where did that go? So many people are on autopilot. And like you say, it only takes half an hour, 45 minutes a day to listen to something, you know, whether it's a different yeah. insight to something. And there's just so much. So that's, there's the three stages. So the awareness, ownership and education. And then the last part portion of it is probably where I come in or people like me come in is accountability, getting someone to hold you accountable to what you say you're going to do. You know, if you want to change, whether it be your diet, your mindset, your spending habits, your, the people that you're hanging around, we're all well and good at saying, yeah, I'm going to do that. You know, how many people have started a, a New Year's Eve, a, a um, first day of New Year resolution and by the 7th, it's gone. They didn't go to the gym. You know, they didn't do yeah. it. We're all good at it. We're all guilty. Man, I, I, I've, I've done so many of them. However, when you get Where's someone to hold you, <laughs> when you get someone to hold you accountable, um, yeah. you're a little bit more aware of, okay, well, you know, I'm having a meeting with Aaron in a week. He's given me these tasks to do. I better do them. Um, and I, I use my kids like this is, I read this in the network marketing book years ago is the best accountability coaches you will ever have is your kids. Cause if you tell your kids, you're going to do this or you're going to, you know, your daddy's working on his business so I can take us away on a holiday. They will remember that. And every week mm. they'll say to you, daddy, when are we going on a holiday or daddy, when are you going to the gym? Like they're like little mini life coaches in their own, but it's, it's uh, the accountability part is, is prevalent because we're very easy at falling off the wagon. And if nobody's watching, you know, it's like, how do you act when no one's around is how you should do everything. But we're very easy at, you know, slipping over to Netflix or slipping over to, you know, ordering dinner and I won't go for that run or, you know, falling back into habits of drink, drugs, whatever it may be. But having someone in your, and it doesn't have to, it doesn't even have to just be a life coach. You know, it can be a brother, it can be a friend, it can be your wife, your partner, you mm. know, this is, this is what I want to do for the year. This is where I want to be. Will you hold me accountable? And, you know, that's, if you have someone who is on the same path as you, perfect, awesome. Unfortunately, some people don't. And you have to find the people who align with what you want to do and get them in your corner. Um, and sometimes, as hard as that is, that means getting rid of the people who are in your circle now. Um, you know, I have, I have one, one guy who... I've coached, he, he had a really bad friend circle and they were all into drinking and drugs and, you know, not really working, whereas he wanted to elevate himself for the sake of him and his kids. And he had to pretty much cut ties with all of the friends that he had because he knew that he was going to drag them back in. And even to the stage where, you know, I heard Tony Robbins say one thing, pretty much similar to what I said just now, like you need to cut ties with those in your life who aren't helping you. Um, progress or get to where you want in life and sometimes that can even be your mother your father your wife your boyfriend it can be those people who are close to you that if you put enough onus on yourself you have to say okay enough is enough now with your mum mm -hmm. and dad and wife you don't have to run for the hills and cut them out but you can certainly limit the time that you have with them or you can limit what you tell them so that you're not getting the negative response to, oh, what are you doing that for? Or why would you want to do that? Because, you know, not everyone's going to understand the journey that you're on. And, you know, some people are comfortable sitting in their own shit, but then they mm. project on others. Mm. Oh, I wouldn't do that. Oh, you shouldn't do that. And if people can understand that that's a limitation that they've put on themselves, so they think they have to put it on you. You know, I, I grew up with parents telling me that, you know, money doesn't buy you happiness. So I have a really, uh, kind of bad mindset when it comes around money without I'm working mm. on myself and then like, like now I say to my mum like have you ever seen an unhappy man on a jet ski and she's like oh it's not all about money and it's not she's right no. however no. money does take away a lot of the stress if you're not worried where your next meal is coming from or you know if the, the red light comes on in your car and you know it's not a, mo a money worry having money is definitely a, a, a net positive you know it's I wouldn't personally I wouldn't involve myself in it fully and you know have my whole life revolve around money and I'm, I'm really not a um, materialistic person for that reason however being comfortable and having your finances all in order and having everything squared away certainly takes away a lot of the stress and anxiety of life and you know there's a lot of people feeling the pinch of that right now yeah so yeah it's 
it's not easy by any stretch of the imagination, but it's also not impossible. Exactly. And, and um, mate, so, so talk me through a little bit more. I, I know that we've, we've gone down um, – no, it's all right. Let me, <laughs> let me rephrase that. Um, work-life balance in construction, um, obviously so – uh, so tell us a little bit more about your, your life coaching. Tell us more yeah. about what you offer to the tradies and, and how, to, how, how it can impact – their health and well-being, you know, their outlook on life, their mindset. What, what? Yeah, give us, give us a, a really um, good look in on that. Yeah. So, so essentially, the the, the work work life balance thing that you, you mentioned there. I uh, one of the simple things that I uh, put together that I learned again. I haven't reinvented the wheel with this. I've just taken it from somebody else. But I call it them. Leave your boots and shit at the door. So it's you know as. As men and fathers in construction, you know, you'll work 12 hours, you'll rush home, and you just go straight into dad mode. And, you know, sometimes it's great getting home. Other times you'll get in and your wife's just chewing your ear out. You know, where are you? You've worked too long, done this. And, you know, we've got bills coming out of your ear, this, 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 this. The kids are screaming, you know, the kids are used. We've all been there. Like, you all walked in that behind the baby. So this is something I used to do. And initially I felt guilty for it. I would take 10 minutes before I'd go home. And I would sit in the car and I would either have a power nap or a meditation. Like um, as, a, as the years have gone on, I use meditation for a lot of my stress relief, a lot of my anxiety, um, my breath work. These are all things that I implement in my coaching with the guys. But the, this one specifically is called leave your boots and shit at the door. So nice. take 10 minutes when you pull up outside your house or you pull into the garage, or even if it's easier, do it around the street so that you know, the wife's not twitching the curtain and she sees you sitting there. But take 10 minutes. <sighs> Breathe, let everything go. You know, the shit from the day, the arguments, the fights, the worries. You know, uh, you know Have you ordered enough concrete? Do you, has, you know, have we done these permits? Or whatever it is, let it go so that you're able to take 10 minutes to yourself and that's where they're kicking the boots off is, you know, it's kind of a present before you walk through the door. So that then when you walk into the door, you're present as father, husband, son, whatever it may be, you're there for your loved ones. Um, because we all take work home with this, the phone never stops. However, it doesn't have to, if you go into the house with the energy that you had at work, the frustration, the fight, it's just going to build up. And that's, it takes away from the time of what family time is supposed to be. You know, none of us, mm go to work every single day because we love it. We do it because it pays for the things that we love. That's the kids, house, holidays, all of those things. And if we don't take time to to just have a break between them, it it can massively impact. And, but then in the morning, it's the same on the flip side. So before you leave, if you have anything from the night before, you know, the kids have been up late, the kids haven't been doing what they're told, you and the wife are fighting, there's money issues. Before you put your boots on, take 10 minutes and just let that go. Because if you take that to sight, you're going to hit sight, fight and show and arguing with everyone. You know, you're going to be the grumpy tradie who's shitty with everyone. And you know, I have been, you know, they used to call me the angry Scotsman because I would be the smallest, but it'd be the loudest, angriest, most grumpiest fucker on sight showing at people. <laughs> um, so that's a great one. It's simple. Like they cost you nothing to take 10 minutes before you go in the door and people go, oh, I need to get home. You don't. If you can take 10 minutes to let it go, release everything, get yourself in a better mindset, better headspace so that you can be who you need to be at home, you'd be amazed at how how much of an impact that has. What's um uh, if 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 I can if I can just jump in quickly there, what uh, do you have a favorite app that you use that you find the best that you've chosen from everything that you've tried? Um I actually there's so I have them all on my phone. I'll, I have the Calm app. There's a really good one for men. It's called uh, Men- Mental, M-E-T-T-E-L-E. Bear Grylls, the kind of SAS guy back oh, in the yeah. UK, he put it together. Um, but really, I just YouTube. I'll just Google like oh, meditation, yeah. YouTube. It, it's there. Like it's All these apps are great, but again, mm. you have to pay for them. You have to pay prescriptions. There's so much stuff out there that's for free. Um, free, and yeah. Uh, that is, you can just put, you know, meditation, um, de-stress meditation in YouTube and there's a myriad of them and just find your best one, one that works for you. Something else yeah. that I, I, use, I teach and I use because I have used it myself is uh, a form of kind of meditative breathing. It's called box breathing. 
Um, and I used to do this. I see it really bad anxiety. I'd wake up like three, four o'clock in the morning. My chest would be tight. My back would be sore. You know, I'd be over go, going over everything in my head. And, and most site managers or even construction managers will, will, will know how that feels. So uh, just box breathing, it just, it helps slow everything down, slows down the mind, slows down the heart, just relaxes everything. And you're able to actually think clearer. So I used to do this on the way to work in traffic. So you're like, even if you're driving, you don't have to close mm. your eyes to do it. If you can close your eyes, if you do it in your office or you can even nip away to the dunny and do it in the toilet for 10 minutes if no one's watching, you can sit and close your eyes. But I used to just do it in traffic and it's literally just you sit and breathe in for four seconds, hold it for four seconds, breathe out for four seconds, hold it for four seconds. So that's where the kind of the box comes from. You just do this on repeat for, you know, nine or 10 minutes. And it's amazing the impact it has. Like you're able to just think clearly, everything relaxes. Like the US Navy SEALs use this as one of their main tools. And I have a joke, like when I do my site presentations, I'm like, fuck, if it's if it's good enough for the US Navy SEALs, it's good enough for Jimmy the Trader here in Sydney. <laughs> yeah, like, absolutely. And it, and it, but it's, it's, it's powerful. And these are just kind of some of the, the, the de-stressors throughout the day. And you can use this yeah. as much as you, as you need to. Um, I say I have done it in the car. I have done it in the site office when no one else is around. Um, and once you become aware of the kind of anxiety and the panic attacks creeping up, if you can feel them building, you do this and it just negates it. And then you're able mm. to function throughout the day. Um, yeah, nice. Yeah, and they're, they're powerful but basic exercises. Mate, yeah, absolutely. And uh, look, I think what I, you know, from my experience as well, my personal experience, I find one of the biggest challenges that people have is dealing with time and that that self-talk of, yeah, it all sounds wonderful, but I just don't have the time to actually put it into my day. Like I don't have the 10 minutes at the start of the day. I don't have the 10 minutes at the end of the day because my life so is so jammed with all of these other activities and tasks. How do I uh, how do I actually do that? Do you come across that often in conversations that you have with people? All the time, all the time. And what I say to them is like, go to your phone and check your screen time. Tell me mm. how long you've been on your phone um, throughout the day, and tell me you can't take ten minutes out of that. I use it all yeah. the time. I call I call out my guys when they tell me that. Um, and the amount of amount of guys who have actually reduced their screen time because when they see it, like, fuck, no way, I waste that much time. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, yeah. And, what, and what do you what do you gain from it? Like, yeah. like you said before, you know, half an hour, 20, you know, half an hour, an hour of scrolling. We all do it. We're all guilty of it between, you know, social media is the, the greatest and worst thing that was ever invented because yeah. it's, it's it, one, it makes people think that they're communicating and they're, you know, they're social, but they're really not because you go into any lunchroom and there's like 50 lads like this. Head oh, yeah, I've seen No it. one's <laughs> communicating. Like, and it's just like, yeah. boys, you see it on trains in the morning, you see it. So that's. I call guys out on that one all the time and they tell me, oh, I don't have the time for that. I'm like, look at your screen time. Mm. Tell, tell me that you can't take 10 minutes out of that screen time or half an hour or an hour to do that. It, it, none of it comes down to time. It all comes down to discipline. It all comes down yep. to, you know, do you want it enough or are you feeling the pain enough of what you're going through that you'll take 10 minutes out of your day to do it? Um, so it's, you know, w- when you see that, it's, it's really not any, it's not a, an excuse. It's not a reason. It's mm. just an excuse. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's, it's it's what they refer to as a limiting belief um, yeah, in the Anthony Robbins world of, and yeah. I and I won't go into that today. But of course, yeah, I've, I've had a very similar background to you, and I've experienced a lot, a lot of those courses. So you know, there's a, there's a lot in there about um, you know limiting beliefs and how to remove them and what they actually mean and how they stop you from doing things. Um, yeah. But, it's, it, it, it's something. It's, it's something you you self. It's self imposed on, on through your mindset. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's also one thing as, as men who have never tread the path that, that that we have. They just don't know this stuff. Like they don't know that mm. they, there's limiting beliefs. They don't know that you know the beliefs that your mum and dad had on you are their limiting beliefs that they passed down to you, and now you yeah. just run and think that you know. Oh, I can't. I can't run that business, or, or you know, I'll never be able to make this much money, or you know. I stayed in this relationship because that's what you do. It's like, well, this relationship mm. is killing you. Like I had to learn that the hard way. Like I, my marriage broke down two years ago and I wish I would have been able to just put a stop to it and say, you know, no, this isn't working. Um, I didn't, I tried to do, you know, I, I went down the route of going elsewhere and uh, I, I now regret it. And I look back and think, how could I have done that? But 
at the time, it was my only outlet. It was the only way I was able to keep my family together and get what I wanted, like the selfishness mm. of it. But now looking at it, like, you know, me and my ex-partner are in a better space because we are co-parents rather than man and wife. And a lot of people are scared to do that because, oh, you don't, you, you don't um, break up your marriage. You know, you have to stay together for the kids. And then what the kids yeah. become 18 and disappear and you're left looking at each other like, why, you know, we don't know each other. You know, I'm not, you're a different person to who you are when you meet, like, you know, yeah. 15, 20 years ago. And if you can mitigate that and you can realize that and if you can work on it and brings two of you together, it's awesome. But if not, then you have to cut your losses in the best way possible for the kids. You know, too, the mm. old phrase, two happy homes is better than one toxic one. And we, you know, we, we both swear by that now. Like our girls, yeah. they're, you know, they're seven days with their mum, then they're seven days with me. Um, and they both see that me and their mum are happier apart. But they also see us interacting together as two co-parents. Like, and it's, yeah. That's, you know, 10, 15 years ago, if you were to say that to some people, like mm-hmm. generations, you know, the old the old world generations here in Australia, it's, oh, no, you have to stay together, even though you hate the guts of each other. Yeah, Why would, yeah, it's, uh, and again, and it's not for everyone. Like Celebrating people. milestones of misery. <laughs> That's like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> why? Like, yeah. seriously, just choose a path that's not together. It's not, di- well, it is difficult. But once you get on the other side, um, you'll rediscover who you are as a person. Like you'll find that person. Like it, you know, every, yeah. As we learn in SES, um, which I'm a volunteer for here in Queensland, we learn more from our, and I say this often, we learn more from our mistakes and we do our successes. So whenever we're doing briefings and debriefings on, on every job that we do, we pull it apart and we talk about all the stuff that went wrong, all the shit that went wrong, and we go, okay, how could we have done that better? You know, it's, and that's how life should be it's not yep. it's not meant to be um you know smooth sailing i mean that's that's a pipe dream you know the most yeah anyway i could be on the bandwagon essentially, and go what, <laughs> essentially what you do in the ses is what i do with guys in life culture yeah uh, I, I find out you know where they're at what went wrong why did it went wrong <clears throat> how can you learn from it you know i have a, I have a phrase everything is a lesson or a blessing so if yeah. you learn from nice. a mistake awesome if it happens to you and it's a benefit and it's a blessing. Like you're not, to, to think that you're going to go through life in one, not fuck up is inconceivable. But if you keep doing the same thing, then that's on you. Like, you know, mm. I, I'm a firm, I'm a firm, especially as men, like we don't know what we don't know. Nobody gives us the handbook to be men, fathers, partners. It's just not something that's done. And you, you're going to learn the hard way sometimes, but you have to learn it. Like if you just keep, doing the same thing, repeat on repeat, repeat, repeat. And you don't, you know, I know some people who have been, been, you know, 10, 15, 20 relationships and they only last for a couple of months and then they keep blaming another person. You're like, no, there's a common denominator here and it's not those Mm -hmm. other 20 people. You're like, you know, there's something. And if you can, what you do, look at the situation, look at you and say, okay, what went wrong? What did I do wrong? You know, could I have handled that better? what would I do better next time? Like, really, we need to do that for ourselves. Um, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, mate, look, it's um, 100%. Sorry to cut you off. I didn't mean to. <laughs> it's just, um, yeah, no, you, you, you're right. And, 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 mate, hats off to you for what you're doing. You know, we need to change the narrative. You know, we, we talk about numbers and statistics and, you know, we look at the amount of suicides that happen around the world every year. And I think we're tipping the scales just over 800,000 suicides every year. I think 600,000 of those suicides are categorized as men um, in the research. I think one in every eight minutes, um, you know, is what sort of the numbers we're looking at at the moment. Um, and it's, uh, it's horrific. And, you know, there's a, it's, it's scary to think that you know men are tipping the scales in their favour. Um, we obviously would love for no one to be um, taking their own life, um, but certainly suicide amongst men is at, at, an, at an all-time high and that number's not going down. Um, so having a conversation about this in this space is so um, relevant and powerful. Um, so, mate, look, you know, just to wrap up today, I mean, obviously with your business, um, 
you know, we love connecting in um, our community with people like yourself um, and all of our guests. How do people find out more about what Coach to the Tradies is all about and how do they get in touch with you if they want to get you involved in their organisation or even a one-on-one? Yep. yep. So it's um, I'm everywhere. I'm on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook. So it's Coach to the Tradies, Aaron WDQE. I'm, I'm the only one that I've found so far, so you can't really miss <laughs> me. My, um, my website is Hustle Talk Coaching. Uh, and you can go on there and get one-to-one coaching. You can get wellness presentations for your um, your organisation, um, as well as you know keynote speaking, whatever it may be. Like I'm, I'm, the more people who will hear me, allow me to speak this message and pass it up, it out, allows somebody else to put their hand up and say, okay, maybe I do need to help or I do resonate with what he's talking about. So yeah, please socials. Um, I am putting together uh, an event here in Sydney uh, because. Pretty much, uh, no one would let me join there. So I thought, fuck it, I'll I'll build my own community. Do so the first of it is in Western Sydney here in October, with the look to do, you know, South Sydney next year, maybe this the um, CBD, maybe Eastern Suburbs, but then looking to grow it kind of all out throughout the states. Like I'm going to Tassie, uh, been invited to come to Tassie in October, so it'd be good to maybe do one down there. And essentially, the event is for nice. pretty specifically, and it's focus on mental health physical health with a little bit of networking it's for tradies who are in the same space as you and me you know want better or want more want to learn but they might feel that they don't have anybody to 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 go to so it's a community of guys who are there for each other to learn and grow and you know talk about this stuff because i think what we what we've lost is that brotherhood you know uh, Mm. that we need to have so if anyone's in sydney this October, then, you know, reach out to me and I'll give you the details because I'd like to grow this as far and wide as possible because the more conversations I have with men like yourself in construction, I know I'm not the only one who wants to do and be better on all facets, mental health, physically and business. So, Mm. yeah, I appreciate it. That's awesome. Thank you very much. No, that's awesome, mate. Hey, um, we will make sure that we get all of those in the show notes and uh, have them available when the uh, episode goes live. But mate, no, thank you. I really appreciate you sharing your journey, being um, really open and transparent and giving us a look into your life, mate, as well. I think that's really uh, you know, honourable thing to do and, and share that journey with others. And um, I'm sure that, um, you know, there'll be people listening to this episode um, taking some next really positive powerful steps towards, you know, a better life. Um, but yeah, mate, like we, uh, like we coined, coined it on every show, um, until next time, stay connected and um, looking forward to uh, chatting to you again, um, hopefully in person next time. Absolutely. I'd love to, buddy. We'd love to. Thanks, mate. Thanks for listening to this episode of Tiling Connect. Don't forget to rate and review this podcast. To see more of Tiling Connect, jump on our socials and follow us via LinkedIn, Instagram and Facebook. If you'd like to be part of the show, email us at tilingconnect at gmail.com. Until next time, stay connected.